So this is today's lab that we're working on. It's temperature and specific heat. It's actually a pretty straightforward lab um, in that you're performing. In the first part, we're doing temperature conversions. You may want to refer back to your chapter one notes. You're going to see a series of temperatures provided, and you'll have to convert those temperatures into Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin. I've provided you the following conversions in order to convert between uh, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. These conversions are also found in your lab manual. The second part of this lab focuses on heat transfer and heat exchange. And in this case, we are calculating the heat capacity or specific heat of an unknown metal sample via calorimetry. And we'll talk more about that in our lab lecture. The last part of the lab, we're looking at energy in relation to nutrition. We are first going to look at a common nutritional label and calculate the amount of energy and calories and kilojoules that can be obtained from a commercial food sample. We'll then look at the combustion and energetic analysis of a sample food, such as a peanut, and we'll measure the amount of energy stored in the peanut via calorimetry method. Okay, so that's a broader overview of what we're doing. We'll talk more about the calculations specifically in a moment, but that's our broad overview. So in terms of your procedure for the section on temperature, I provided you a series of temperatures and your goal is to calculate and convert each of these temperatures into Kelvins and Fahrenheit. That's the first part of this lab. In the second part of this lab, you're, we are going to be performing a calorimetry experiment by looking at the transfer of heat between an unknown metal and a sample of water. I have a full recording of this lab that I ran, and you'll need to watch the video to collect the temperature data. In part C, we are looking at the combustion of a commercial food sample, such as a peanut, and we're going to be analyzing the amount of energy stored in that peanut um, by measuring the temperature change of water as the peanut is burned and converted into therm and and some of our as it burns we're essentially converting and we're reacting the molecules found in our peanut they're burning converting to carbon dioxide and water and we're converting some of that stored chemical energy into thermal energy which is heat okay so that's the video that you'll watch to collect data for part c and then for part d i provided you a photo of a common food sample in this case this is a can of uh, i believe it's a can of beans and based on the content in terms of protein, fat, et cetera, and carbohydrates, fibers, and sugars, you're gonna calculate the amount of energy expected in terms of calories and kilojoules, and then compare your calculations from the nutritional guidelines to the actual reported amount of calories per serving of sample. Does that broad overview make sense? Does that broad overview of what we're doing today make sense? We're looking at, we're looking what was at- that? Yeah. What's that product for part D? Uh, it's a sample of beans, but it, that, that, the, it, the specific food sample doesn't matter. It's mainly the nutritional information that we're looking at. So we're essentially looking at this nutritional label, which is something that you'd see in a common supermarket on most, um, most food materials. And based on the carbohydrates, proteins, sugars, and fat in the sample, we can calculate using the nutritional guidelines outlined in your lab manual, which I've provided in this Canvas page you can calculate the exact amount of calories present in the sample and you'll compare the calories calculated 
using the nutritional guideline method to the calories actually mentioned on our sample, which is 110 calories. Does that make sense? Any questions so far for this broad view of this experiment? Okay, so let's now switch our view to the view of our lecture whiteboard. And let's talk a little bit about each part of the experiment, what you're doing, what data you're collecting, and how you're going to analyze your data. So in part A, you're given a series of temperatures. So in part A, you're primarily dealing with temperature conversions. So we're given a temperature in degrees Celsius. So let's look at an example where we have like 3.4 degrees Celsius. You're gonna convert the temperature in degrees Celsius to Kelvin and Fahrenheit. To do that, we are gonna use the conversion factors that we have been provided in our note set. So for example, Fahrenheit is equal to degrees Celsius times 1.8 plus 32. So punching this into our calculator, if we have an initial temperature of 3.4 degrees Celsius, we take 3.4 times 1.8 plus 32. And that would give us a temperature in Fahrenheit of 38.1 degrees Fahrenheit. To calculate Kelvins, you take the degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So if we were converted to Kelvin, we'd take our 3.4 plus 273.15, and that gives us 276.15 six degrees, oh no, not degrees, just Kelvin. There we go. So that's what you're doing for part A. You're looking at the temperature, you're writing down your temperature readings, and then you're converting each temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit and Celsius to Kelvin. Does that idea make sense? Does part A make sense to everyone? Yeah, this is just an example. Right. Yeah, yeah, this is just a representative example. So in part B, we are measuring the specific heat of a metal. So let's define some terms. So heat is defined as energy transferred as a result of differences in temperature. I mean, we, we see this intuitively. For example, if you have a, a metal pan, so let's suppose you're cooking with a metal pan and you heat it on the burner for a little bit. And now suddenly you have your metal pan sitting at like 100 degrees Celsius, okay? You take it off the burner. And if you try to pour some water, if you take some water at 22 degrees Celsius and you put it in the metal pan, what's gonna to happen to the water? What's gonna to happen to the water when you put it in your metal pan? What, 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 when, 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 like, when you go to cook and you heat a metal pan and you pour the water into the metal pan, if the pan is hot, what, what do you notice happens? What happens to the water? It spills, it like bubbles up. It bubbles up, yep. And, and, it, and, it, and does the water, get increase in temperature or decrease in temperature? Increase. Increase, exactly, exactly. So what's going on in this process is we have a transfer of heat from the high temperature pan to the low temperature water. 
And that's why the water sometimes makes this sizzling sound as it may even be get, at, get to a high enough temperature where it starts to boil. Okay, so heat is the energy transferred as a result of differences in temperature. If two objects are put in close proximity at a different temperature, they will transfer thermal energy. They will transfer heat until they reach the same temperature. So if you let this sample sit for a really long time, eventually you'll end up with your two components at the same final temperature. Okay, and we'll call this final temperature T final. Now, what we can do from this data is that by measuring the change in temperature, of both samples, we can calculate the amount of heat transferred. So an important idea to tie this all together is that different objects different objects chain, undergo changes in temperature at different in different let me just say they undergo changes in temperature in different amounts as they absorb or release heat. And to respect this idea, we'll use this term titled specific heat, which is formally defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of sample by one degree Celsius. Okay, so water, which has, water is a really interesting example because it has a high specific heat known as CS. Water has a specific heat of 4.184 joule per gram degree Celsius. So what this number is telling us is that water requires a lot of heat to raise its temperature. We have to put a lot of energy into our water sample to change its temperature. Professor, does that say 4.184? Jules? Yep, exactly right. Okay. So just to define each of these units, joule is, is a unit of energy. Grams is a unit of mass. And degrees Celsius is a unit of temperature. Now, just for reference, we know intuitively, for example, when you try to, let's say you try to boil water, when you try to boil water and, and you, you have your, your metal pan set up and you're trying to boil your water, what gets hotter, what gets to the higher temperature first? What gets to the higher temperature first? The metal pan or the water? When you try to boil water, what gets really hot? What gets to a really oh, high temperature? The, the, the pan. metal pan, exactly. And the reason for that is a sample metal such as copper have a specific heat of around 0 0.4 joule per gram degree Celsius. So what this is telling us is that our metals typically require less heat to raise their temperature. 
So as we can see, as heat is transferred between objects, the temp the amount that the object changes in temperature depends on its specific heat, which is unique to each sample. The water and metal have a different specific heat. So when they transfer heat as a result of differences in temperature, their, their change in temperature depends on the sample. Professor, the, the CS, oh, that's the specific heat. Yep, exactly. Just kidding, I didn't see that. Okay. Perfect. So what I want you to take away from this, specific heat is a measure of how much heat is required to raise the temperature of our sample for one gram by one degree Celsius. Water has a high specific heat, so we have to put in a lot of heat to raise its temperature. Metals have low specific heats, so they readily change temperature in response to gaining or losing heat. Does that make sense? And we see this intuitively because if you try to heat water in a metal pan, the metal pan undergoes changes in temperature more readily. We have to put a lot more heat in in order to start to boil our water, in order to start to begin to warm our water. And that's because water has a higher specific heat. It takes more energy to raise its temperature. Does that idea make sense? Does this concept of specific heat make sense so far? Can I get some confirmation in the chat that everyone's? Yes. Okay. So we can write out, so in, in calorimetry, we can utilize and measure changes in temperature to calculate changes in heat. So calorimetry is the measure of changes in temperature. to calculate changes in heat. Okay. So in this in this experiment, in this experiment, our goal for part B is to calculate the specific heat of the metal. So to do this, we are gonna take a metal and we are gonna heat this metal to 100 degrees Celsius in water, okay? So we have this metal sample at 100 degrees Celsius. We're then gonna take our insulated container known as a calorimeter and we are gonna have the calorimeter filled with a known mass of water. So this water is going to be at roughly 22 degrees Celsius that we'll call our T initial for our water. The metal will be at 100 degrees Celsius, which we'll call the T initial for our metal. We're then gonna mix the metal and water and we're going to observe the final temperature. So we're gonna place our metal in our sample of water and as our metal is at a higher temperature, our metal is going to transfer heat. So our metal is going to transfer heat to the water. As a result of this, the metal decreases in temperature and our water increases in temperature. We are gonna let the samples sit. And then once our samples have finished transferring heat, we are gonna record the T final. We're gonna record the final temperature. Okay. The final temperature will be the same for both the metal and the water. Now, once we have the final temperatures established, we can use the following calculations. 
The heat gained or lost by an object can be defined as the mass times the specific heat times the T final minus T initial. Okay. By the principle of conservation of energy, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is only transferred between objects or transferred between different forms of energy. So then by that principle, anytime our metal loses heat, our water gains heat. So our metal loses heat and our water is gaining the heat lost by our metal. Does that idea make sense? Does that principle make sense? Any heat lost by our metal is gained by our water. So then, by conservation of energy, any heat lost by our metal is gained by our water. Now, we can rewrite heat using our specific heat expression. So Q metal would be written as the mass of our metal times the, sp the specific heat of our metal times T final minus T initial of our metal. You'll record the mass of the metal, the T initial and T final from the video. The heat gained by our water is equal to the mass of our water times the, the specific heat of water, which is 4.184 joule per gram degree Celsius times T final minus T initial water. Plugging this, these expressions in, we get the mass of our metal times the specific heat of our metal times T final minus T initial for our metal is equal to negative one times the mass of water times the specific heat of water times T final minus T initial of water. Now, if we're wanting to calculate the specific heat of our metal, we can rearrange this equation and we get negative one times the mass of water times the specific heat of water times T final minus T initial of water over the mass of metal times T final minus T initial of our metal. So this is the final equation that you'll be using to calculate the specific heat of the metal. Does that make sense to everyone? Does everyone understand where you're getting each piece of data from the video? Does this make sense to everyone so far? Yeah. Perfect. So that's part B. So in part C, we're going to look at the energy in foods. Okay. So to talk a little bit about what's going on here, let's suppose we have a sample of food. That sample of food is composed of a range of different, different molecules, right? So if we look inside our sample of food, we have a range of different, we have a range of different molecules such as amino acids, sugars, etc. So, in this process, we have stored energy in this food in the form of different chemical bonds. And by breaking these chemical bonds and forming new chemical bonds, we can produce energy. So if we break down 
this food sample into carbon dioxide, water, and other simpler components as a byproduct of this decomposition or combustion-like process, we get out energy. This same principle is used biologically where we take complicated molecules and we decompose them into simpler fragments. And in turn, we get out energy as a byproduct. Now in the body, of course, we store that energy as, as NADH and in other forms, rather than just releasing that energy as heat um, for obvious reasons. But by the same token, we can take a look, we can take a look at a, at a food sample and by subjecting our food sample to combustion, so we're gonna take our food sample and by burning our food sample, by reacting our food sample with oxygen, we can in turn measure the amount of energy stored in the food sample. And this energy can be used to calculate the amount of calories or joules of energy found per gram of food sample. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. So here's the experimental setup. We're gonna take our food sample and we're gonna put it on a little pin above a sample of water. This water will be at an initial temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. We are going to burn this food sample. We're gonna light it on fire. And in turn, all of the energy that is stored in our food sample will be released as we take our food sample and we break it down into simpler molecular components. So when we burn our sample, we get out carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen dioxide, and other byproducts. And the energy stored in our food sample in the form of chemical bonds, we are breaking and forming new bonds and that bond breaking and forming process releases energy. And that energy, can be thought of as the Q of our food sample. This is heat released as the result of burning our food sample. And that heat is gonna be transferred to our water. Does that make sense? Does everyone understand how we're measuring the energy stored in our food sample? In, our, in the body, we take our food sample and we react it via biological processes and we decompose our food sample into simpler molecules, this act of breaking and making new bonds generates energy. And that energy we use in the body to power biological processes to make NADH and in turn, we can use it to sustain ourselves and continue running all of our different uh, biological functions we can measure the approximate amount of energy stored in our food sample by burning our food sample. That in turn breaks the bonds present in our food sample, forms new bonds as part of simpler compounds, and this bond breaking and forming process releases energy. And we can measure this energy by burning our food sample and measuring the transfer of heat the transfer of energy from our burning food sample into a container of water. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that make sense? Can I get some confirmation in the chat that everyone understands that basic idea? So energy is stored in foods in the form of bonds that we can break and then make new bonds. And this act of breaking and making bonds, both of those processes together releases energy. We'll talk more about how this, how this process of decomposing compounds and getting energy out from compounds works in biological systems. But the simplest analogy I could think of is we're taking this complicated molecule, we're decomposing it to simpler molecules, and as a result of this decomposition process, almost combustion-like process, we release energy. And that's the energy that we would get from 
a sample of food if we were to eat it. Okay, so any heat released from our food sample is absorbed by our water. So we know that the heat released from our food sample is equal to the heat absorbed by our water. And we've seen this expression before in our calorimetry experiment, in the part B of our experiment. So we can measure the heat released by our food sample by measuring the mass of water using the specific heat of water and by measuring the final and initial temperature of the water. We can then calculate the heat or the energy associated with our food per gram by taking the heat released by our food sample divided by the mass of our food sample burned. And that can be rewritten as the heat released by our food sample divided by the mass initial of our food sample minus the final mass of our food sample. So at the end of this burning process, at the end of this burning process, we'd be left with like a little bit of, of remaining food sample, like a little bit of charred remains, and our water would be at a final temperature. We'd write down the final temperature of the water, and we'd write down the final mass of our food sample, and we'd use that to calculate the heat released by our food sample, and then the energy in terms of joule per gram of our food sample. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that idea make sense? Do these calculations make sense? But the Q, what did the Q represent? The Q represents the heat energy released when the food is burned. It, it, is, also an, it is also representing the energy stored in our food sample that we would get if the food sample is burned or eaten. Um, so it's, think, it's like the, the amount of, but amount of, en of, I guess you can call it chemical potential energy stored in our food sample. And this is partially how you can estimate, for example, the amount of calories or the amount of energy we can get out of a food sample. Does that make sense? So you use a Q represent the heat energy. Yes. So the heat released when we burn our food sample, that, that thermal energy comes from the chemical potential energy that our food sample has. And in this case, we're using that potential energy in our food sample to make heat. If we were to eat the food sample, we can use that potential energy to drive biological processes. So to make for example, NADH, which we use to power other biological processes. We can use it as part of, we can use that energy to drive the synthesis of, of different molecules that we need as part of biological functions. So that potential energy stored in a food sample can be used for a variety of purposes. In this case, the easiest way we can measure the energy stored in our food sample is by measuring the heat produced when the food sample is burned. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Uh, the M initial and M final, that's the mass of the food sample before and after burning. Because the combustion process, because this burning process isn't perfect, we only want to calculate and we only want to really measure the heat produced per mass of sample that we burned. If the sample doesn't completely burn, we don't want to, we don't want to underestimate the amount of heat produced by our sample. So that's why we take the initial mass of our sample, which will be large, minus the final mass of our sample, which is the mass remaining after burning. And that tells us how much of our sample actually burned during this process. Does that make sense? 
perfect. Professor, can you tell me what is that minus one? Ah, so this negative sign is essentially stating that when the food releases heat, the water is absorbing the heat by conservation. So when the, in order to measure the amount of energy released by our food sample, when energy is released, Q is negative. When energy is absorbed, Q is positive. So this just ensures that the sign conventions are correct. Does that make sense? So if we see minus, minus it, result, it means it released energy, right? Yes, exactly right. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's part C. In part D, you're given a nutritional label. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch our view to the nutritional label just to showcase how we'd read this label. So we're given a nutritional label to work with. And it's important to note, it's important to note what information we are given from this experiment. So I have put this nice little sentence in I put this nice little sentence in italics because it's what you'll use to calculate the amount of energy stored in your food sample. So allow me a moment to copy and paste this sentence and then we'll talk about how to perform these nutritional calculations. Okay, so let's copy this sentence. This tells us the amount of energy for different components of a food sample and for different food types. Okay, now give me one moment to copy the picture. So we have our nutritional guidelines. And then we have our picture. So now that I've copied that from my Canvas page, let's take a look. Okay, this picture is a little large, so let's downsize it a little bit so that way it's a little more manageable. Okay. So we have our picture containing the nutritional guidelines. We have our picture containing the nutritional guidelines. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna read off all of our different components. So we have our carbohydrates, fats, proteins. So then looking at this, we don't have any fats, so we don't have to worry about that. We have carbohydrates, we have 21 grams of carbohydrates. And for proteins, we have seven grams of protein, right? Does everyone see where I got these numbers from? Does everyone see where I got the 21 and seven from? Yes. So then, so then to calculate the energy, we know that for carbohydrates, we have 17 kilojoules per gram. Per gram of carbohydrates. And we know that we have 21 grams of carbohydrates. And that in turn gives us 357 kilojoules of energy. Now, if we have seven grams of proteins, looking at our guidelines, it would be 17 kilojoules per gram. And that in turn gives us 119 kilojoules. We add these together. 
and that gives us 476 kilojoules of energy. If we wanted to calculate 476 kilojoules and we wanted to convert kilojoules to, if we wanted to convert kilojoules to kilocal, which also are equal to capital C calories, we know that in one kilocal or one big C calorie, there are 4.184 kilojoules. So 476 over 4.184, that gives us a value of 114 big C calories, which pretty closely matches the 110 calories mentioned on this label. Does that make sense to everyone? How we completed these calculations and how we figured out the amount of energy in the form of calories in this commercial sample of food. Yeah. So that is our complete overview of today's lab. Any questions on today's lab? Any questions on the procedure or calculations for today's lab? Well, this is the example that we would, um, this is how we would calculate for number four on section D? Yes, exactly right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this example? So one thing that you may want to do as sort of a fun activity, and I'd even be willing to give an extra point or two of, of, of extra credit on this lab, is if you try and find a food object in your own house and try doing the same calculation for that food object in your house. And I find you often get the most interesting data when you look for for like a, a commercial snack food or, or something that, that you may not think is particularly healthy um, and because then you get some pretty large energy values for those samples. Um, it's always pretty interesting for students to see, wait a second, if you burn that sample, you could, could warm a sample of water pretty substantially. Um, so if, if, you'd, if you'd want, in addition to the example that we've done using the picture I've provided, you can also analyze a food sample in your own house and attach it as part D in your report. And I'd be willing to provide a point to two of extra credit um, for completed calculations of the caloric energy found in a food sample or, um, that you happen to have in your house. Does that make sense to everyone? Professor, I have a quick question. Where did yeah. you get the 17 um, kJ? Ah, this guideline is found in your lab manual where nutritionists have established that there are the following energy values per gram of the three food types. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. That's what you pasted from the notes, right? Yes, yes exactly right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So is that the 17, uh, that's pretty standard for everything? For carbohydrates and proteins, fat, it's 38. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions on this lab? If not, we'll stop the recording to allow the recording.